Hello. Today's scripture reading is from Acts 20, 36 through 21, 14. Acts 20, 36, 21 through 14. Hear the word of the Lord. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. The next day, we went to Rhodes and from there to Patara. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city, and there, on the beach, we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship, and they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemais, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. The word of the Lord. It's good to open up God's word with you, church. Uh, We as a church have been walking through the book of Acts in the fall series called The Beautiful Church. Now, we introduced many themes throughout the series, what makes the church so beautiful. And today, in a sense, I want to ask you the question, to you, what makes church so beautiful? Now, I mean, you heard from our own members candidate what makes the church so beautiful to them. I will not be surprised if some of you will answer by saying, you know, the church is so beautiful because of the very people of God. The fellowship we get to share, as you already heard our members candidates share that, makes up the church so beautiful. And in light of that, we want to talk about that. Today, we are saying, as you wrap up our series this and next Sunday, today we want to focus on that emphasis. Today, we are saying, Church is beautiful because our shared mission forges a friendship that transcends difference. Now, I'm going to elaborate on each each phrase, how a shared mission forges a friendship that transcends all differences. Now, why is this so needed for many of us who are gathered here? When you look around the world, our contemporary world a substitutes stimulated experience over genuine connection and steady love that comes in relationship. What I mean by that, we settle with the stimulated experience, whether it be social media instead of a genuine friendship face-to-face, whether it be we settle with friendliness rather than friendship. And that we settle into because we desire kind of instant attention and gratification. We constantly are in a performance mode to put up a certain facade. We are in the marketing mode. I am great. Can you see me? Can you notice me? Because we are immediately wanting to grab attention because we tend to settle with that kind of stimulated facade over than reality. So... In a sense, sometimes we live as a bunch of pretender, pretend to be cool. Like deep down you say, I'm a nerd. Would you really love me if you know me? Uh, that in the end, sometimes we are just projecting 
rather than really showing who we are, that God has made us to be. Yet we are saying in a world that is all about settling into just a substitute of what genuine friendship can offer, they only settle into perhaps our performance evaluation. Where understanding is nowhere, where judgment is everywhere, we are saying today specifically church is beautiful because our shared mission forges a friendship that transcends all differences. Let's elaborate that dive into that together. So three ways we are going to talk about the first three Acts 20. First, true friendship binds. Second, no friendship isolates. Third, friendship's core, mission unites. We'll elaborate on three. First, true friendship binds. Second, no friendship isolates. Third, friendship's core, mission unites. Now, let's go on by one. So first, the true friendship binds. We today read Acts chapter 20 and 21. We began from Acts 20, 36. It would be great for you to go there because I'm going to elaborate on that. But let me give you the context of what leads up to verse 36. Here, Paul is saying goodbye to his beloved church, Ephesus. And he's giving final charge to Ephesian church and elders there. Hey, love one another. Don't fall into any false teaching steadfast to the truth you have. And after all the giving the charge, here is emotional farewell that is happening. That's the plot we are seeing. Verse 36, let's pick it up there. When Paul had finished the speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. What a goodbye that is filled with affection and emotion and tears. So literally, did you notice in verse 37? They wept, they embraced, and they kissed him. Now, this kissed him is a little bit different than New Testament customary greeting. Like, greet one another with a holy kiss. That's, in a sense, greeting. This kiss is more than that. They are talking about they genuinely loved and cared for one another. They're weeping. This is flow of their affection to Paul. We don't want to see you go. Stay here. Why? Because they are fearing that they'll never see him again. They might or might not have seen him again. And we will see in a reason just for a second. But can you imagine how, how did Paul conduct himself? How much has he loved this church that the people are saying, please don't go. We really want you here. Can you stay here any longer? Not only that, Paul, next destination, he goes to Tyre. Look, verse chapter 20 on verse 4. What happened there too? We sought out the disciple there and stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they all urged Paul not to go on Jerusalem. When it was time to leave, we left, continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. They take a beach walk together even before they go, and they kneel, pray together. Paul, don't go. We want you here. Not only in Tyre, jump down to 21 and in Caesarea. Leaving the next day, we reached the Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip Evangelist, one of the seven. Verse 12, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? They bonded such firm friendship in the time that Paul had stayed, whether it be Ephesus, whether it be in Tyre, whether it be in Caesarea. People are like, can you please stay with us? Our fellowship sweet, and we want you here. Now, what do you learn from this, Chilton? A couple of things. Well, first, I'll say this. Friends are worth pursuing today. Yes, even in the middle of transition. What I mean by that is this. Now, can you imagine Paul saying, hey, people in Ephesus, people in Tyre, says Sarah, actually, you guys are not my destination. I'm only in transition. My destination is in Jerusalem. I'm trying to go to Jerusalem. So I don't really have time to spend with you, but love you. Bye. No. The fact that they're weeping over Paul's departure says that even in the middle of a transition, busy season of life, 
Paul is spending enormous time with them wherever he goes. He prays with them, weeps with them. So what do we say? I mean, oftentimes one of the excuses that I, excuses that I use, and sometimes I hear you saying is, oh, I'm busy. Well, I'm in the middle of a transition. I, I really don't have time for others. Guess what? If Paul, Paul is facing impending death soon, he knows going to Jerusalem is a kind of impending death sentence. I'll talk about that in a moment. But even in the middle of a crisis and transition, he takes time to spend all the time with them to the degree that people are weeping over Paul. We all go through a stage of life, preschool, kindergarten, elementary, middle school, high school, career, young adult, singles, married life, raising kid, adolescent, teenage years that you raise your children, empty nester. If you said, well, I'm just transitioning, I really don't have time to invest right now where we are, that means you're not going to. <laughs> Friends are worth pursuing today right now where you are. See, if Paul spends his time with them, whether he has months and days with the people of God, that they are weeping over Paul. And if you remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, on the night before he was betrayed, who was he with? He was with his friends, sharing meals together in their Lord's Supper. How much do we, even in the middle of transition, you need one another Church is beautiful because our shared mission forges a friendship, and church is turned to you. Will you pursue one another? There are beautiful people in our church, and they are worth getting to know. Look at Paul. We have such a misconception about Paul in New Testament. He writes such a rational sentences. So this guy's got to be cold, just a rationalist. Look at how much relationship he builds, even in front of his impending death. So friends are worth pursuing today, even in the middle of a transition. Second thing we learn. Now, we looked at Acts chapter specific. Let me take a one step back to look at the entire scripture. Let me ration with you the need of friendship. To need and to want friendship is not the sign of immaturity. It's not the sign of neediness, but it's actually the very sign of spiritual maturity. That you need and want friends. Well, what I mean by that, um, here, Theology of Friendship 101. Let, if you go all the way back to Genesis 1, 126, profound verse. It says, it's a creation of God. God says, let us make mankind according to our image. Two profound things you learn. First, did you see that it's not just God the Father, it's let us make mankind. That means even before the creation, our God, triune God, Father, Son, and the Spirit exist in friendships. And then, secondly, our triune God who exists in friendship says, let us make men according to our image. God who desired the friendship, dwelt in friendship with one another, made us in the likeness of him. Therefore, it was his design for you to desire friendship. Do you get that? If our God who exists in friendship created us in the likeness of him, of course you should have won friends. It's not a neediness that you won friends. It's a God-given desire because, secondly, when you look at Genesis 2, this is a perfect world. God has created a world now. Everything's perfect. Nothing, no sin has entered the world. But at that time in Genesis 2, 18 says, when God looks at Adam, it is not good for the man to be alone. In a perfect world, everything was good up to that point. God says it was good. It was good. It was good. But in a perfect, sinless world, first malediction, not a benediction, this is not good. That God pronounced for man to be alone. So what does God do? He creates Adam's best friend for him to share his life with. If our perfect God, even before creation, exists in friendship, even in the perfect world that God has created, he demanded a friendship, how much do you and I in this fallen world need one another whom we can share our lives with. So what does that show, Chelton? Church is beautiful not only because of your vertical relationship with God, but church is beautiful because of your horizontal relationships with one another. Look at Paul. He's spending enormous time with them. Jesus spent enormous time with people of God in his earthly ministry. God designed us to desire friendships. Will you pursue one another and get to know one another? Now, so we looked at the Acts 20, Paul's example of how he bonded over believers. And we looked at the overall kind of scripture theology of why God designed us to have friends to share our lives with. 
Let's take even one more step back. Let's look at the culture around us. Secondly, why no friendship isolates? It is, we saw it, it's not good for men to be alone. And yet, if you're honestly looking around, we live in a world of friendship crisis. Because we always resort to the stimulated experience, the fake version, friendliness instead of genuine friendships. We settle into much lesser version of it, sometimes out of fear. Since the fall of Adam, we are literally busy covering ourselves up, literally and figuratively, fearing that if you really know me, all my flaws and failure, will you really love me? So in a sense, we're desperately trying to perform that we are great, to kind of market ourselves. Hey, I'm worthy to get to know I'm great. And we're desperately fearing to show our genuine self because none of us want rejection. But we just talked about it. To want and desire friendship is a good thing. So we want that. And we, deep down within you, you want friends too. You just don't want to admit it. You say that you're busy, but you do want that. But at the same time, as much as you want, you're so busy covering yourself up in the fear of rejection. And that isolates many of us. It gets deeply lonely in a world of friendship crisis. Now, when I prepare a sermon, things like that, I'm intentionally looking up some related source to make an example. This is not that. It literally tumbled upon my feed. I, just, I wasn't researching for it, but this Wednesday, I happened to read an article that NPR published. Maybe some of you read that article too. Kind of, it's an article that said, she lived in a New York hotel for 40 years, more than 40 years, but her life was a mystery. In their article that I just stumbled upon, it talks about the residence of room 208, uh, Hisako Hagesawa. She lived there over 40 years in that hotel as a residence, but her life was a mystery even unto death. The people only saw her on Friday on her shopping day when she goes out. She always has a beautiful smile whenever she goes out, and if the hotel bellboy or anybody helped her, she would write personalized thank you letter. Very friendly lady. Everyone thought she was so friendly. But one of her conversationalists, whether you want to say neighbor across the hallway, Rene Corrigero says that, only all the pleasantries they exchanged were only pleasantries about whether and all that all these years they've gotten to know each other. And now I'm quoting the article rest. It says, one day in 2016, Jerry the bellhop realized that Hasegawa hadn't come down. Management went to check and found she had died in her apartment all alone. She was 82. One of the investigators started asking questions about Hasegawa's family and friends. Cory Jaro, Rene, the friend, realized that after all these years of living across the hall, she had never seen Hasegawa with anyone, a thought that still troubles her. I should have asked her, they think you are intruding or something, but no, that's a misconception. I think you should ask, she said. None of the hotel staff remember Hasegawa having any visitors either. 40 years, lived alone, died alone. Nobody even knew about it. We live in a lonely world. No friendship isolates us, doesn't it? Some of you might say, well, but Jim, that escalated quickly, though. <laughs> we are not quite that extreme. I am not like that, though. But don't you, aren't you tired of constantly being judged, kind of scaled upon? You sometimes feel you do that yourself too. Oh, they are worthy to be my friends. I don't really want to. On the other side, you feel that judgment same by others too. Aren't you tired of being misunderstood and misjudged all the time? Funny thing is, none of us really know what we are going through. I mean, William Ikes, his personality and psychologist, he published a fascinating article, How We Just Got No Idea With One Another. He says that only strangers that you meet, 25% of the time, which means one out of four times, you read that person correctly. Whether you think, oh, that person's stylish, that, that person's rich, oh, that person looks educated and nice, three out of four times, you're r way off. And then you think 33% of time, he goes on by saying that people you know well, you're only right one-third of the time about them. 
the two-third of them, maybe you, you feel that way. I know Chelton people. Oh, they all look so friendly, look so content. They must be happy. Two out of three times, you may be awfully wrong. Maybe even though there are many of us pretenders here, including myself sometimes, wearing beautiful smile, but deep down, we desire friendship. We are wanting to say hello. And many of times, we are afraid. Sometimes we want to be said, hello, can someone notice me, see me? Your perception of others, two out of three times are wrong. And people specialize in really reading others. People claim to be very intuitive. They only write one out of two times. That means there's understanding nowhere, judgment everywhere. <laughs> and the psychologist concluded by saying, married couple, ironically, the longer they marry, the less they know each other. I'm like, that's not true. And I was like, what he meant by that, oftentimes spouse, you're stuck with your spouse that you knew when you met that person. You're stuck in the image, but over the years, your spouse have changed drastically. We are only stuck with them with a bunch of expectation and always misfiring judgment on each other. You are this, you are that. In the end, even married couple don't know each other. What a wonderful world we live in. <laughs> See, why is that, church? Because we all come from vastly different backgrounds. No friendship isolates unless we ask and get to know one another. Just friendliness will not cut it. I'm convicted by that myself too. Don't get me wrong that I'm perfect. I got this right. See, we all come from different perspectives. Church, imagine this. Um, let's say, even you are looking at this worship center together. Let's say an interior designer walks in this room, way they look around the world. And then let's say a security trained specialist comes in to look around the room. Both of them are looking at exactly the same thing, thinking completely different thought. Interior designer might say, oh, that color might need to change. Oh, I would design this way, that way. Security person would say, X needs to be that way, that way. Looking at the same thing, but vastly different. Unless you ask one another, build a friendship with one another, everyone just misjudging one another, constantly missing, misfiring. Judgment everywhere, understanding nowhere. While a f- true friendship binds, no friendship isolates. Now that I got us pretty depressing notes, lonely people, uh, let's see where is the hope for Christian that we see in this text. I am here not trying to paint rose-colored glasses, but there's something unique about Christian friendship that I even remember I, when I went to public high school here in America, in Colorado, they were closer friends of mine, but the one who stood next to me on the wedding day is the guy that actually I shared the friendship with two decades because there was something about him and I tied together our mission for Lord Jesus that brought us 20 years later. Let's see what's our hope in that. Now, if you look at verse, uh, go back to chapter 20 and verse 22, there's something pretty awkward about I'm about to show you. Look, verse chapter 20, 22. This is Paul speaking. What does he say? And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. In other words, here Paul is saying, what? Hey, Holy Spirit told me to go to Jerusalem. Take note of that. All right, go to 21 chapter 4. Now, this is people in Tyre. What does it say? We sought out disciples and there stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. These people are saying, hey, Holy Spirit told me you shouldn't go. Who is right? <laughs> 2112, when we heard this, we and the people, they're pleading with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Paul is convinced that he's supposed to go. Holy Spirit told him. And the people of God entire said, hey, Holy Spirit told us to, you shouldn't go. Awkward. <laughs> who's, who's right in there, especially when they claim the name of God? Can you imagine the sharp disagreement in that? But do you realize that in this plot, this sharp disagreement does not end up an explosion but does only end in love and embrace and tears and affection. Do you realize that? Like if you look at verse 14, people said, when he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said that the Lord's will be done. Why did they say that? Because they saw something beyond personal friendship. What united them, this people of God and the Paul, was not like, hey, do you think I'm cool? Do I look attractive to you? Do you think I'm smart? Oh, you're hurting my feelings. 
No, for them, there's something beyond just 101. There's something beyond that united them. At the friendship's core, there was a mission that united them. What was the mission? Verse 13, Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm not ready, ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul is saying, the Spirit of God told me when I got converted, he must suffer for my, my namesake, and I am willing to suffer, lay down my life for the name of Jesus. And these people of God sees that. Even though they had a sharp disagreement, they're like, we bless you, let you go. They walk alongside a beach together, they pray together, they embrace one another, they loved one another till the death. And guess what? Paul was right. This was his death journey. Historian Eusebius, if you ever read his book, Ecclesiastical History, talks about the emperor at the time, Nero. He was, I mean, I'm not saying this word lightly. I really mean that he was a psycho by all means. He would even kill his mom and his brothers, and he would declare himself, I am the chief enemies of God. Eventually, Paul would be killed as well. I'm reading from Ecclesiastical History, book 2, chapter 25, saying, Nero saying, thus publicly announcing himself as the first among God's chief enemies, he was led unto the slaughter of the apostles. It is therefore recorded that Paul was beheaded in Rome itself as well. <sighs> Paul said, the Lord's will. The people of God said, Paul, you said the Lord told you to go. May the Lord will be done. The church, despite their sharp disagreement to them, there's something more than them, more than their personal feeling. There's no self-consciousness between them because it wasn't really about two of them, how much they liked one another, how much they looked at one another, but they're looking at the same God together. Do you see the incredible picture? They are kneeling before God. Look, verse 36 of 20 and 21, 5, 36. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. 20 on 5, when it was time to leave, we left and continued our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. This is the great picture of spiritual friendship. Church, when you are kneeling before the same God, there's an astonishing way that will bind you to one another. Because your friendship isn't really about how much you think one another is cool how much you think the other person's worthy enough to be your friends, but you're looking at the same God and running the same mission. Friendship's core mission unites. Have you seen a movie or read a book, Lord of the Rings? What unites the great Frodo and the Sam Gamgee? Their mission to destroy the ring of evil and the power. They journey together for a mission. And that book is really about friendship, of the friendship forges based on the mission that they quest together. Have you seen a Harry Potter? <laughs> What unites Harry, Ron, Hermione? It's to save the wizard world and to save them from Voldemort. Their mission is what united them. This past Sunday, we as a church prayed together. I got to pray together with men and women. Some of them, I was like, man, they're praying exactly how I, want, how I would have prayed. Some of them prayed very differently than how I would have prayed together. Yeah, guess what? We are kneeling before the same God, and there was a special bond that united me. I'm like, I know God more because of I prayed with you. There's something incredible in Christian friendship because our mission to be more like Jesus unites that you just cannot manufacture. This is not a stimulated, fake version of experience, but genuine friendship you get to build because you are pursuing together the same God. I mean, if you ever lived through the 90s, I debated whether to talk about this one. I'll say it. There's a song, friends are friends forever if the Lord is Lord of them. Do you know that Michael W. Smith is that corny song? Uh, maybe some of you do know you don't know that. Uh, you know, every youth camp you went and closed with that song, friends are friends forever if the Lord is Lord of them. You cringe at it, but it really is true. Because for you, what you are sharing is just more than personal liking. Church is beautiful because shared mission forges friendship that transcends differences. So many of us, us talk about it all the time, church. I mean, I hear that people from, Jin, are you sure? Is she the one? Was he the one that you married? We, we are obsessed over marriage partner. But have you ever obsessed over your friendships? 
You would formally believe that God has ordained your marriage. What about friendship? <laughs> Imagine this. What if your best friend, you were just born uh, one decade, five years different? Maybe you were born just about a little bit over, not even close distance, that you ended up going different elementary school, different college. You would have never forged that friendship. You think it's your wonderful and the discriminating taste that picked your best friend. No way. Their secret master orchestrator conducted your best friendship by his will and design. Friends are not to be taken lightly. God ordains friendship. The fact that you are sitting here in this room with the people of God, if you're just born a few years apart from one another, if you just happen to live a little bit further away, you would have never gotten to know one another here. Church is beautiful, not only because we worship vertically, but we share the worship experience with the people of God. Will you pursue one another? When Jesus said, hey, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, you can say to Christian friendship, you have not chosen one another, but God is saying, but I have chosen you for one another. God has brought you to this community to reveal his beauty for you to get to know one another. So today, will you pursue one another? You want to be understood. Why don't you reach out and understand one another in this desperately lonely world? You know friendship is what you need. Some of you who tasted that friendship, you know for over the decades of steady love that you got to share together. It's a beautiful thing. You don't need to pretend. Will you taste that honey rather than hearing that honey is sweet? Go and taste the spoonful of honey of friendship yourself today. You and I need that. And if you just don't know where to begin today, you might ask, Chelton, do you remember that our Lord and Jesus Christ initiated a friendship with you? First John tells us, there is no greater love than this to lay down one's life for his friends. We aren't even his friends, we're his enemies, but he laid down his life to initiate friendship with us. And if you have been impacted by our Savior's friendship to you, that this has become life-changing force, why don't you go out and extend the same love where judgment abound, where misunderstanding abound, where is, there is only stimulated experience of fake version of friendship. Show them genuine care for one another. How wonderful would that be that we become a people of God who really weep for one another in times of need? We we'll laugh together to share their mundane joys together. Sometimes friendships is not about improvement, but just to witness, just to be there in times of need for one another. You think you can fix one another? Just be there. Why? Because our Lord was there at the cross for you. He initiated a friendship through his sacrificial love. We became friends of God. May we go forth extending the friendship because church really is a beautiful thing, our shared mission to run to be more like Jesus, unites us, or forges a friendship that transcends all different perspectives, all different stages of life, all different hobbies, all different whatever you want to fill the blank. We have that kind of power available to us. As you run to Jesus, look who runs next to you, and will you say simple hello, take them out for coffee, share a meal, your people that you sit across from you today, Jesus died for them too. They are worth getting to know. Let's pray together. <laughs> God, I lift up those of us who are desperate to be seen today. God, I have encouraged through the example of Paul we've seen. This is such an affection-flowing text for the mission of God. But, oh, Lord, as much as we want to reach out, we want to be seen and cared for, too. So, God, I lift up those broken hearts that say, does anybody really even see me? I'm tired of pretending. Does anybody really see who I am? Everyone is going just for the fancy object. I am nobody. Nobody wants to get to know me. God, would you give us eyes to see them? Would you give us eyes to reach out to them? What a beautiful testimony of church it will be where world divide one another with every single little thing. Despite of all the differences in the world, we are united and love one another, genuinely care for one another. There's understanding and acceptance, not a judgment.
because what unites us is the fact that we all sat at the foot of the cross, what Jesus Christ has done. So, Lord, move us and shake us and make our church even more beautiful. May our fellowship even abound today as you go about our days that you cause us, you move us, you galvanize us to move toward one another as we run to you. So, God, thank you first for being our friends. We look to you. In your name we pray, amen.